Hello, my name is Dr. Daniel LaRoche, and today I'm going to talk to you about the history of blacks in medicine for a few minutes and the need for more. Malcolm X stated, just as a tree without roots is dead, a people without history or culture becomes a dead people. It's really vitally important for us to learn our history, particularly when it has been purposefully not taught to us properly. Imhotep was the first physician. Though Imhotep's birth and death is unknown, he had to be living around 2600 BC, and during his life he was a doctor, a priest, an architect, a grand advisor. He served these pharaohs, to, these jobs to four different pharaohs, and Imhotep also wrote the first medical text. He diagnosed and treated over 200 diseases, and he's mostly famous for designing the first pyramid ever. Here are some sculptures of Imhotep that are right here in New York City at the Brooklyn Museum. In, in medicine, in book four of Homer, the Odyssey, it simply states that in medicine, Egypt leaves the rest of the world behind. This quote and the many examples of foreign princes who retained Egyptian physicians testified to their high repute and influence beyond their borders. The Persian emperors, emperors in Cyprus, Cyrus and Darius each relied on an Egyptian personal physician. Ancient surgery such as tree panning were some of the first surgical procedures performed um, 10,000 to 6,000 BC, before the Common Era. And this is a procedure in which a hole is drilled into the skull to relieve pressure on the brain. This is the most ancient form of surgery for which objective evidence exists. Mathematics, the primary source of some ancient Kemet, which is now known as Egypt, the Rhine Papyrus, and it's now, this is located in the British Museum. And it is, again, in the Nile Valley that we must look for evidence of the early influence on Greek mathematics. With respect to geometry, the commentators are unanimous that the mathematician priests of the Nile Valley knew no peer. The geometry of Pythagoras, Exodus, Plato, and Euclid were learned in the Nile Valley temples. And you can see here the triangle that we all know to help determine the unknown um, were developed in uh, ancient uh, Egypt, which is known as Kemet, which is located in Africa. The Ibis papyrus, this is considered the oldest medical papyrus discovered to now. It's a huge roll, about more than 20 mil, uh, meters. It's chiefly an internal medicine reference, as well as diseases of the eye, skin, extremities, gynecology, and some surgical diseases. And for treatment of those diseases, 877 treatments and 400 drugs were described. The Edwin Smith papyrus is five meters long, 17 pages, and chiefly concerned with surgery. It describes 48 surgical cases of wounds to the head, neck, shoulders, breast, and chest. This is the first medical textbook. The papyrus now resides in the collections of the New York Academy of Medicine Board, right here in New York City. This is a um, carving of a medical kit, and this is from the temple. It come obos. This shows knives, drills, saws, forceps, pinchers, hooks, things that were used during surgery, okay, uh, throughout ancient Kemet. Okay, so medicine has a deep ancestral foundation in Africa. This is a wall painting of a Theban grave, and sovereigns from foreign lands have frequently appealed to the pharaohs to send them their best physicians, and this depicts Neb Amun was a scribe and physician of the king, receiving a Syrian prince and paying him for his services and gifts. And according to Herodotus, King Sirius of Persia requ requested Amasis, Amos II of the 26th dynasty, to send the most skillful of all Egyptian eye doctors. And here you can see prosthetic surgery uh, that was performed. And this is highlighted in an article in the Lancet that in mummies from 1500 to 700, BC had evidence of prosthesis on their toes to help walk and stand properly. And you can also see the color of the skin that was used to match the color of the people back then as well. Spirituality was very important. Okay, this is a bust of Oset and Hiru. Uh, this ancient Egyptian mother-child theme was eventually transferred to Christianity, but that mother-child theme existed for thousands of years beforehand with the teachings of Ma'at, M-A-A-T, the 42 laws of Ma'at. It's the 42 commandments that existed thousands of years before the Ten Commandments. You can see an Egyptian sculpture of a battalion of 40 Nubian armed archers ready for war. You can see how the people are depicted back then. 
This is a Nubian princess in an ox chariot from the Egyptian tomb. 1320 BC, Africans invented the wheel that was used in transportation in this particular image as well. Now, when the Romans came in on the scene, and this is about 122 AD, and this is thousands of years uh, after Egyptian culture and civilization was very advanced. Galen, who was a prominent Greek physician, wrote, quote, a catalog of ethnic stereotypes describing blacks as having kinky hair, thinner sparse eyebrows, wide nostrils, thick lips, sharp white teeth, chapped hands and feet, and an offensive odor, and eyes with large black pupils, and inferior intelligence, and an oversized penis. And this was perhaps the first time the cognitive deficit was associated with the black race. And in other uh, physicians and uh, European researchers would try to insert their racism into uh, classifications, uh, making it seem like uh, people evolved from animals and then, you know, blacks came from monkeys and then whites came thereafter. And then other Europeans came in in Africa to help establish slavery. And slavery could not have been established without the cooperation of African kings. Uh, this is the king of Dahomey. Uh, that um, traded with the uh, European slave traders as well uh, to make money because these uh, Almina slave castles in Ghana could not have been built without the help of Africans and African labor as well. And you can see here um, the conditions of Africans coming to the Americas during the slave trade was quite atrocious, uh, but Africans were in the United States way before that with the Olmec heads uh, from uh, uh, the Mexican area in the, in the Americas as well. But the physician and the health care that was being provided to blacks coming over was not to live a long life, but just to accommodate and make them strong for the slave uh, trade profit. Um, the life expectancy of slaves was maybe 10 or 20 years once they were doing slavery. And that was enough time for a slave master to make their profit. Uh, during that period of time. And so the health care that was given to blacks was distinctly different than that can give it to whites. And other Europeans, as late as the 1700s as well, would classify people for racial and sociopolitical purposes. Um, Carl von Linnaeus described Europeans as ingenious, sanguine, governed by law, uh, American rubescence, happy with his lot, liberty, loving, tanned, and irascible, governed by custom, Asiatic, ludicrous, melancholy, governed by opinion, and the after Niger referring to blacks as crafty, lazy, careless, governed by arbitrary will of the master. And these were physicians describing this. And we know that the enslavement of Africans was brutal with random hangings, castration, brutal beatings, physical and psychological torture for 400 years that still persisted today with police brutality. But despite this, Onesimus, who was an enslaved black man from Africa in Boston during the smallpox vaccine, shared how they used to take the pus from the, from the skin pustules and use that to infect a normal person with deactivated virus to help transmit immunity and develop immunity uh, to prevent the smallpox uh, from developing. And so this is how vaccination was introduced into the Americas to the modern vaccines that we have today. And this was from Onesipus, the same black man. That's a story that's not told. And here is an illustration from the Histoire Naturelle by Julian Barry, once again, to insert racism into medicine to try to depict white as superior to black. And even uh, another European, Charles White. In the 1700s, promoted racist doctrine, saying that blacks bear surgical operations much better than white people, and what would be the cause of insupportable pain to a white man, a Negro would almost disregard. I have amputated the legs of many Negroes who have held the upper part of the limb themselves. And Jane Marion Simmons, who is considered the father of modern gynecology, really exploited uh, black slaves and poor white women to further his surgical career. He purchased slave women in order to operate experimentally on them. He operated on several of these women 20 or 30 times before obtaining the results that he wanted. In 1847, the American Medical Association was founded, quote, for cultivating and advancing medical knowledge, for elevating the standard of medical education, for promoting the usefulness, honor, and interest of the medical profession, 
or enlightening and directing public opinion in regard to the duties, responsibilities, and requirement of medical men. But unfortunately, blacks were not allowed to be part of the American Medical Association, and subsequently in 1895, the National Medical Association was formed. James McKean Smith came in on the scene about 1837, and he uh, was the first university trained black physician. After attending the Free African School in New York, he went to the University of Glasgow, there he worked with the Glasgow Emancipation Society and completed his MD degree graduating in 1837. And so um, this is just a small taste of uh, black history and medicine. I started from ancient Kemet till James McKean Smith, who we're celebrating tonight, his legacy. There's a lot more to know, a lot more to learn. So I encourage you and may this stimulate you to learn more about black history our contributions to medicine globally, and our current contributions today. And may this inspire you to pursue a career in medicine and achieve your goals and follow your passion to become an excellent uh, physician, clinician, scientist, and uh, a person in the healthcare professions. Thank you very much.